The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Happy holidays. Welcome to the BS Report. Just wanted to give a quick shout-out to all the listeners who subscribed to the iTunes podcast, as I requested as my free holiday gift in uh, Friday's column. Very nice of you. Shot us up the iTunes rankings. And just to make this clear, I don't get any bonuses for being in the top 10 and the top 25, top 5. It doesn't matter. I'm just over-competitive. It just bothers me that all these NPR shows are ahead of mine in terms of the downloaded podcast. So if you like this show, if you like... Uh, if you like me, if you care about me, just subscribe to the podcast. It'll take like one second. And then and then I get to go bump up those rankings and I get to look and see, oh, I'm number four today. I'm number three. I get to feel good about myself. I don't ask for much. Everything I do is free for you guys. So, yeah, that's my plea. Anyway, we have a special – we have two holiday podcasts this week. This is the first one. We're going to do the lines with Cousin Sal. We have a star from the Rocky series, and I'm not going to divulge you. But we have a star from the Rocky series, and that will be at around the 35-minute mark of this podcast, I'm guessing. We're going to have a little cameo from Dickie Barrett of the Mighty Mighty Boston's, who is performing a bunch of holiday shows back east. And then at the tail end, my daughter is going to sing a Hanukkah song. So this is an action-packed podcast. All right, final week of the NFL season. As always, our friend Cousin Sal is going to join us to pick the lines. He picks the lines first. I pick them later. We'll see who does better. And uh, and Sal, coincidentally, almost fortuitously, uh, as I was waiting for you to call, I saw on my desk, for whatever reason, I guess my wife was shuffling papers, it's our pick-by-pick -pick fantasy draft from September. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Here, here, was, here were your top eight picks. Westbrook. Yeah. Braylon Edwards. Plaxico Burris, Wes Welker, Lawrence Maroney, Derek Anderson, Lindell White, Tony Gonzalez, Eli Manning. Also, Jerry good. Porter, and then Matt Forte, randomly in the uh, like 12th round. Yeah, that's a pretty good top four, uh, <laughs> although I will never take any of them again except for Westbrook maybe. But uh, uh, well, we Listen, the, here's, here's the, the team that won our league, the Jennies. Yeah, let's hear it. Terrell Owens. Ninth pick overall. I'm going to say that didn't really work out. No, that's not good. Ryan Grant with the uh, 12th pick. Nope. Andre Johnson, nice. Yep. Brandon Jacobs, nice. Yeah. Jericho Cotri, okay. Ernest Graham, eh. Bernard Barian. David Garrard, first quarterback pick by this Wait, they haven't. That's their first quarterback. Wow. Yeah. Chris Cooley, Ted Ginn, Ahmad Bradshaw, Jake DeLome, Packers D., Nick Folk, Watson, Ingram, Garcia, Brandon Jackson. Wow. That's the team that won our league. That makes you want to quit the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, it's like, we, you know, when D'Angelo Williams turns into Barry Sanders circa 1997, yeah. inexplicably for the last five weeks of the season, it's it, how do we even, why do we even spend time doing well, I think fantasy football? Four of the top five running backs and I ended up the top point getting running backs, you, you wouldn't even consider taking the first round. Like, Peterson was in the mix, but then it was like, uh, it was Thomas Jones and uh, Michael Turner and, like you said, D'Angelo Williams and then someone else who you just wouldn't think of taking until the third round. It's, it well, I don't especially, want the first pick next year. I don't want the first three picks, I don't think, next year, right? Well, here's our, here's our first round. Tomlinson, uh, uh, Westbrook, yeah. Steven Jackson, Peterson, Adai, Brady, Moss, Marion Barber, who just murdered you in the oh, playoffs, yeah. uh, Terrell Owens, Clinton Portis. Oof. That's lousy. Yeah. That's lousy. Yeah. But, anyway. All right. So yeah, well, we're we the, uh, we're in the business of picking lines. We're uh we're not we're in the business of picking lines. But before we do, yeah, the Cowboys have broken your heart so many times that we thought we'd try something interesting. We're gonna something uh, different this week. We're gonna do um, a time machine conversation, actually predicting 
what next week's podcast, what we'll be talking about after the Cowboys Eagles game. Oh yeah. Well, you know, this all started for you sent me, you were nice enough to send me an email after the, the latest crushing loss saying, I've run out of ways to apologize to you for, for these, these losses. Yeah, now. yeah. And I was thinking about that. I was like, yeah, you're right. I can't even say, oh, that was one of our ten worst losses. I, I can't even do that anymore because it seems like every week, I don't know cause if we're, we're on national television so much or what, but it just seems like so many punch-in-the-gut losses over the last three to five years. So. And, and all in different ways. Yeah, yeah. So here's, here's how I think this week. Here are my top three scenarios for this week to, to just crush you. Yeah. Um, I, you know, a, maybe a squib kick, like you're up, you're up four with 40 seconds left. Squid, a squib kick to not, and the and it bounces off two guys. They almost seem like they're going to fump, pick it up, and then they run it 80 yards for the TD. I like that. That's my like first that. choice. Um, Romo, not you know yelling at Terrell Owens like you're you're down three, but you're on like the 20 yard line minute left. Romo is yelling something at Owens, but the center snaps it off his head. Eagles run it back for a touchdown. That I could see. That hasn't happened yet, right? No, not yet. Right. Um. And then I was thinking maybe you're down you're down four with a minute left. Romo hits Owens. Owens is catching it. It's in his hands. He's juggling it, and he juggles it for like 11 yards and then drops it. I like that too. Cause that, I don't remember that happening. I like well only in my in my dreams they've all happened, but because I what? see it. But have you had a, have you had your kicker hook like a 27 yarder to lose the game yet? That'd be pretty good. Or his leg flies off in the middle of the play. <laughs> I, I think maybe I'll just give my concession. Like maybe you should just say you're sorry now for the Eagles' loss, and I'll, I'll just come up with what I'll I'll have said. And all right, let's do that. And then um, like, we'll play it next week. Yeah. Sal, uh, so <laughs> so we're recording this on December 23rd, and uh, and we'll play it next week. Sal, you know I don't know what to say. That I mean I'm running out of ways to apologize to you. Uh, I'm really sorry about what happened to the Cowboys. Well. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate it, and I'm, I'm still bewildered. I mean, it, you know, it comes down to us being outplayed, outcoached, uh, too many penalties. I mean, if you would have told me McNabb was going to throw three interceptions and Westbrook was going to fumble five times and then we'd still end up losing, I mean, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I know it was cold, so none of our receivers wanted to go over the middle, but how does Wade Phillips not go for a two-point conversion down 28-26 with nine seconds left? I mean, how do you kick an extra point there? I just, it was a mistake. I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry. I can't yeah. even do this anymore. I'm getting depressed because I know it's going to be accurate. I think it's good, though. So this is what I learned how to, how to handle every J.D. Drew up at this year. Every time he came up, I just walked myself through all the horrible scenarios that were yeah. going to happen, and it actually helped. It's therapeutic five days at a time. I do like well, but I think when you watch the games, I think before every snap, you should just run through the worst-case scenarios, and that might switch the karma. Let me ask you this, as a, a man approaching 40. Is it okay to break things anymore? To me, it's extra closure on the season. It's like, all right, if I could break something in the house every year, just once a year, when I think the season's over, even though we have a chance to win now. I took my remote control and smashed it against an oscillating fan, and now I knew, need a new one of each. So, uh this is, and believe me, I've gotten better over the years. This is, uh, when is this really a problem, or is it already a problem? No, my answer would be it's always okay to break things, and yeah. and I think the remote control is the logical uh, fall guy. Yeah, yeah, it's got to be. The thing you can't do is throw the remote control actually against the TV screen. Yeah, you have to aim it toward like you know maybe the base of the TV or the wall or whatever. Yeah, I it's don't a tough one to explain to the wife. Toddler. What's that? It's a tough one to explain to the wife. Yeah, I know it. I know it. Yeah. But at the same time, I, you know, especially the way this, I, I gotta say, I've never seen a team give up consecutive 80 yard runs when they needed one stop. I mean, that yeah. was really one for the ages. Ah, uh, that Ken Ham one. Two missed tackles and like the easiest fumble recovery you'll ever see. <laughs> Unbelievable. By the way, we're the first people with any sort of a forum to mention how bad he was in that game. We are, right? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure. I, I, I mean, if you had Ken Hamlin on your fantasy team, he would have given you three touchdowns. Exactly. If, yeah, if touchdown, if single-handedly giving up a touchdown was a fantasy category, he was yeah. worth 18 points. Yeah, for a safety not having been beat on a pass play, that's that's the worst game you could have right there. I think. The, 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 yeah. Well, then I'll to cap it off, I emailed you. I said they should take him to the new stadium and, and open and close that retractable roof on his neck <laughs> multiple times. Well, it's funny. I was watching with my dad because my dad was here, and after like. 
Well, first after the fumble, but then after the first touchdown that he screwed up when the announcers didn't call him out on it. And we were like, wow, Ken Hamlin, go to the game. Yeah. And then to cap it off, he gets stiff-armed as about like almost like a Pop Warner stiff arm. Right. Like the kid who's 50 pounds heavier who just stiff arms like the pipsqueak who's playing free safety. Right. Disgusting. It was embarrassing. All right, let's get to the lens because we have – no Thursday game this week. No Thursday, no Monday. Um, yeah, I don't remember. Uh, I, remember I don't remember them doing this, but the most action-packed Sunday I think I can remember. This is going to be great. The late afternoon games are going to be spectacular. I don't know what we're going to do, but uh, early games to get them out of the way. St. Louis at Atlanta. Atlanta's are they locked into the five seed? No, no. Atlanta could win a division in the two seed. Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. They win and Carolina loses. I'm going to say Atlanta by by uh, by twelve and a half. I said twelve. It's fourteen and a half. So you, you get that one. All right. It's really weird. The, uh, the team won three games last year. They're giving fourteen and a half points to anyone. Brings a tear to my eye. Uh, all right. Let's uh, let's do New England at Buffalo is an early game. Mm. You know, this is the only one I've thought of ahead of time. Mm-hmm. It's either three and a half Pats or four Pats. And the more I'm thinking about it. I think it's three and a half. All right. Well, I'll get this one because I said five and it's six. Really? And that's a good teaser game. Buffalo. Buffalo, good in that Denver game, though. But that's their spoiler win, right? They can't. Well, they've. They already had their spoiler win. That's what I mean. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for them to do it again. Yeah. I think I don't it works know. out for the Patriots. I really do. I think the Jets are just bad enough to win when it doesn't count at home and the, and the Pats are going to win the division. Well, I'll tell you that. Uh, that relying on Brett Favre for anything is 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 mortifying. Yeah. So. Well, yeah, we'll get to that. But what, what, when are people going to get off the that he's a great cold weather quarterback thing? Like I haven't heard that. Uh, no, no, Peter King, none of these guys should kill him for uh, for collapsing like he did in Seattle and in the NFC Championship last year. He can't well, give him credit anymore. No, you're right. I mean, he's old. Yeah. He gets credit for being an old guy who, who feels it in his bones. That's about it. That's all it should be. Kansas City at Cincinnati. Marvin Lewis has the Bengals really uh, really rallying from from <laughs> a historically bad season to just a putrid season. Yeah. Who's the road team? Kansas City's the road team. Oh. Oh, this could be Herm's last game. That's kind of sad. Well, shouldn't it be either of us? Like, the owners should get together and games. say the losing coach, at the end of the first quarter, whoever's losing, the coach gets fired. <laughs> that way you only have to watch like 30 minutes of a game and you can turn on something else. I'm going to say this is uh, Bengals by three. Uh, I said Bengals by three also. It's Bengals by three. So we both get it. There if we go. touches this game, they're out of their minds. They ought to be put away. Um, hey, hold on. I have a quick email for you. Go ahead. This is from Kirby Wilson in Clearwater, Florida. Uh-huh. I think it's hilarious that Cousin Sal gave the middle name of his son to Tony Romo, a player who continually chokes in the clutch, plays in a big market, and dates music stars. Why not just skip the parallels and name the kid with the middle name A-Rod? <laughs> That's a little harsh, I thought. That is harsh. Now, uh, wait, let me address this fellow. What's his first name? Kirby. Okay. That's all I have to say. <laughs> all right, back to okay, the last. I won't go any further. Kirby. All right, uh, Detroit at Green Bay. Green Bay, greatest 5-11 and team in the history of the NFL, <laughs> if potentially. If they lose to the Lions, yes. <laughs> if they lose to the Lions. Actually, that wouldn't be the case. They could be the greatest 6-10 and 10 team ever. Yeah, right. Ah, uh, man. I mean, Green Bay should win this by 30-plus points, right? They should, yeah. Detroit's, uh, yeah. I got to say, you talked me into the Saints last week. I like I like the Lions, and then yeah. you're like, no, 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 the Saints are going to kill them. And then on the way to uh, uh, in the car, I heard uh, – Darnolovsky is going to start despite having the flu. Oh, could it get worse for the <laughs> team? I'm going to say uh, this is artificially high. I'm going to say Packers by 14 and a half. That's exactly what I said, and we're both we're both way off. It's only 10. Ooh. I mean, wow. this is Detroit Super Bowl, I guess. I just don't see how they put anything together against this team. Hmm. That's tough. Um. Trying to because they mix the games. All right, Chicago at Houston's an early game. Did Houston kill your suicide season? Yes, they did. I, I went 15 weeks. Week 16, I had Houston over the Raiders. I, I didn't have many other choices, but uh, what was the the other choice? Would have lost too, right? Denver, Denver at home against uh, Buffalo, but 
That's really a shame that Tom Cable had to end your uh, your suicide run. The Houston had they just it's such a big letdown, I guess, after the Titans killed me, just killed me. That it's it's an abomination. Yeah. So this was who at Houston? Chicago at Houston. If Chicago wins and Minnesota loses, Chicago gets that uh, third seed. I think Chicago stinks. Yeah, they're lousy. I, I, Lombardi put it good today. They they play really hard, but they're just not good. But they they try so hard that sometimes it works out for them. Mm-hmm. But I'm gonna say Houston by by uh, two and a half. All right, I said uh, I said Houston by three. You're gonna get this because it's a pick. I That's like a Houston. mistake. Yeah, I like Houston too. Houston's gonna win this. They they're a good home team. They always rally to the. Uh, this to is win. all you need to know on Chicago making the playoffs. Last night on the Monday night game, they fourth and four at the 34 of the Packers, and they punt. I mean, then the second quarter. I mean, that's that's not going to do it. And just well, and also, if if the Packers make that field goal, that's it. Yeah, it's kind of like it's funny to hear about this alleged Chargers resurgence. Right. Oh, the char. Oh, they're the hot. Look, they they recovered an onside kick to save their season because the guy in the Chiefs jumped up in the air and just dropped it. If he yeah. catches it, it's over. The Chargers are done for the season. Right. So don't tell me that, like, oh, my God, the Chargers are the hot team. That was the most ridiculous win of the year. Yeah, they could, they could lose. They could, yeah. that, that, we'll get to that line. That's a, yeah. that's a crazy thing, too. All right, Tennessee and Indianapolis. This line's a mess because it's been jumping all over the place, but we'll go by what it opened at. Well, what a, Indianapolis has zero to play for. Neither team has anything, yeah. And it's kind of weird that they both made the playoffs, but they're locked into their spots, and they're in the same division. Like Tennessee at Indianapolis. Yeah. What a mess. I mean, I, I, I it starts, I think Dungey said Manning's playing a little bit, but Yeah, but they've they've proven when they have these games that mean nothing. They they play Manning for like one play. Right. Well, no offense to Marvin Harrison, but at gunpoint, <laughs> I'm going to have to go with the Titans being able to run the ball in a meaningless game versus Jim Sorge passing it. So I'm going to say this is Indianapolis by like one. All right, you get it. Here's here's what happened. It's it's the Colts by one and a half. I thought three. I don't know why I thought it'd be so high, but high. But it's Colts by one. But and now move to Tennessee. Tennessee by three. Yeah, that's that's what it should be. Yeah, I guess so. It's another stay away. All right, Giants at Minnesota. Do we see Vince Young in that game? You know, they were talking about it. Can you imagine? He's yeah. I guess he does. I guess he's the man to. So. I wrote this last week, but I still think we see him again in a meaningful moment this season. I just think it's it's just the kind of thing that seems to happen in sports. I remember when the Brady Bledsoe year, when uh, I, I remember pre- even predicting this. You just knew Bledsoe was going to have to come into one of those games, and it ended up being the Pittsburgh Championship, AFC Championship game. But I, I just feel like we're going to see Vince. Well, he's, by he's meaningful moment. moment, do you mean does it count if he has a nervous breakdown on the sidelines <laughs> watching the Titans wrap up the AFC? It could be that. It could be just the, the trainers, the trainers surrounding him as when they should be attending to somebody else. Yeah, that I could say. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, Giants in Minnesota. Vikings win. They're in. And the Giants, you know, I've heard the theory that they're going to try hard in this game, but I think the reason they tried hard last year was because the Pats were fifteen and zero. I don't. Right. No, not really the same historical scenarios here of whether the Vikings can make it or not. Well, the only thing is, so the Giants played a third-string running back. That, that guy's pretty good, right? Yeah, it's true. Mud Bradshaw. But Although the, the fat guy at QB isn't good. Well, no, I think it'll be David Carr. Uh, no, I, I thought about oh, that. I thought even was, worse. I know. I thought it was Lorenzen, but I, think I looked and it's David Carr. Is this at Giants Stadium? No, Minnesota's home, and they have to win. Ah, uh, this is a – yeah, I don't – I don't see why the Giants would would really give a crap about this game. Yeah, I'm gonna say Minnesota by three and a half. Oh, it's higher. I said five. It's six and a half. Uh, I think big. Minnesota New England's a good teaser. Those teams, I really think they both win. Do you try? Would you really? You really gonna advise our our uh, our dutiful loyal listener, listeners in the holiday season to tease Tavares Jackson? <laughs> Honestly, that's your thinking. that's your holiday advice. Tavares Jackson versus David Carr. For a playoff spot. You're the new Grinch. All right, forget it. You're right. You're right. Just New England so far. <laughs> you cannot, I, I, I will not allow you to advise Tavares Jackson to tease. All right. I have to put my foot down on that one. All right, you're right. Carolina at New Orleans. You like my Drew Brees theory. 
What I was won it? you over last week with that. He needs like 402 yards or something in this yeah. game for yeah, the 5,000. Yeah. Uh-huh. And Carolina has nothing to play for? Oh, no, actually they do. Cause no, they, they have to win to, to get the two seed. It's a good game. I'm going to say this is a pick em. Nah. I'm uh, wrong? I, it's Carolina by three. I said three and a half. They're just better, right? Don't they beat up on uh, – well, this would be one of the few uh, home NFC South teams to, to screw it up, right? Carolina coming off an emotional Sunday night overtime game, now playing on the road again in a dome. Yeah. And Jake DeLome in New Orleans, he's from there. Right. I don't know. What I feel happen? like that should be a pick em. It was probably 10 days ago we thought Carolina they might be the best team in the NFC, and now they could be a five seed if they lose this. Well, man, remember that that week? It was like week seven. I emailed you the Falcons 7-1 division odds. You talked me out of it like you always talk me out of bets. Oh, I did? Yeah. Oh, I my hate God. You. Seven to one. Could have gone against that this week. Oh my God, you're right. Drew, I, I think Drew Brees. Uh, I want to see him break that yardage. What did you say? Four hundred two yards. I, I think it's like three. I, it's something like three sixty to get to five thousand, but it's four. It's a little bit over four hundred to get to Marina. I want him to break the record, uh, put a pair of isotoners on, and give Dan Marino the finger. And I want it to come on a three-yard completion down uh, 17 points in the fourth quarter. I mean, we have to feel a little bad for Marino, right? This record's all he has. He never won a Super Bowl. <laughs> right. Marino's like, really? I can't have this one record? I thought this would stand. Cleveland yeah. and Pittsburgh. Oh, that's a great game. <laughs> that's awesome. Pittsburgh's locked in at number two? Yes. Cleveland's locked into a new coach, a new GM, and a new uh, organization. Well, before you pick the line, Cleveland has agreed to uh, play its backups the same as they've been doing for the last month. <laughs> so. Ken Dorsey might have been the nadir of QBs this year. <laughs> yeah, he was really bad. I don't know one thing that he does even mediocre. I'm going uh, to say... He to the Bengals pretty well. Even though Pittsburgh has nothing to play for, I'm still going to say Pittsburgh by 8.5. Uh, yeah, you're closer. It's 10. I, I said seven. I don't know. Uh... That's embarrassing if you're the Browns. You can't even get within a touchdown when you when you're trying to finish your season with dignity and the other team has zero to play for. Yeah, I guess even the second string defense for Steelers will, will lead them up. Uh, it reminds me right, the Pats had a couple of games like that where they had nothing to play for, but their defense, even the reserves, were just so good they overwhelmed the other team. Yeah, could happen. Uh, six to six right now, including uh, ties. I'm a little off this week, I gotta say. Well, this is a weird. I don't even know what to say. We gotta figure someone to put with the Patriots right now. Oakland at Tampa Bay. What a collapse by Tampa, and and also Oakland continuing the roller coaster. Yeah. I, their four wins were all like these dominant wins. Four? Are they have four wins or five wins? You just should should never. Is it? Four? I think they have four. I could be. Yeah, wrong. but all of them were like. You know, legitimately good wins where yeah. they, they controlled the game and dominated the other team. Yep. Tampa, not necessarily out of it. No, they, if they win and the Eagles beat the Cowboys, they get the sixth spot. We watched this game together. Let's do this again. Remember we watched the Super Bowl game together on a bus from San Diego to L.A.? That's right. That was the first night of Jimmy Kimmel Live. That's right. Let's do it again. Let's blow off the schedule and just take a bus and watch this game. It's too bad we can't call Daniel right now, our former executive producer, and, and have him explain why he gave Warren Sapp two segments but George Clooney three minutes. <laughs> I think he was advised by Art Shell in that d- decision. I think that's that's another podcast to deal with that stuff. Daniel Kelsey. Jimmy still defends that, by the way. Yeah. Look, Warren Sapp at the moment was much bigger than George Clooney. He's gonna he be just won the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, Oakland at Tampa. Yeah. Tampa by eight. All right. Yeah, you were off even more than I was. I said nine and a half. It's 13 and a half. Oh, that's absurd. Don't they score like 15 points a game? I don't, I don't see how they. That's, that's an absurd lot. line. Tampa's terrible, too. Yeah. I mean, they've, they're they going the other way. Yeah. I don't get that. All right. We're on to the afternoon games. These are most, you know, I'll get rid of the lousy ones first. It's, uh,. Washington at San Francisco. I think Washington played their last good game of the year last week. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say San Francisco by 
two and a half. Uh, who would you say was favored? It's Washington at San Francisco, right? Right. San Francisco by two and a half. Yeah, you see, you get that. I said I said Washington by two. I don't know why I did that, but San Francisco's favored by three. All right. Uh, yeah, we'll just move on from that. That's nothing. Seattle at Arizona. <laughs> Let's move on quickly. <laughs> Seattle at Arizona. By the way, this just back real quick. Is this four wins or five in a row for Singletary if he if he wins? No, uh, yeah, something what like they, that. Well, we called it like three weeks ago. We said they looked like they were going to be the team that just covers every week for whatever yeah. reason. Um, well, I'm Arizona. sorry. This was who at Arizona? Seattle's at Arizona. Oh, I love Seattle. They, this is they carry home get off the field. I predicted this. By the way, that there. was the best. The best, by far, three-win crowd I've ever heard or seen, right, in Seattle? Oh, yeah. yeah you got to hand it to them. But on the other hand, they, you know, it's been such a traumatic year. I think they're yeah. rallying around anything. Yeah, they could still win the division, right? Four and 11, five and, <laughs> Arizona's five and ten. Yeah. They need a lot of things to happen. <laughs> um, Seems like they're the best team in that division. Man, I, I don't, you know, I know the line's going to be skewed toward Arizona, but I don't, I, they really haven't shown any semblance of anything. I'm gonna say uh, Arizona by four. All right, you you hit it exactly because it's it's four. I said two, but it's now six. It went up to six. I like Seattle. I, I think Arizona too. stinks. All right, now the three good uh, late afternoon games: yes. Jacksonville at Baltimore. Baltimore needs to win to get in. I'm pretty sure, right? Yes. Yeah. The Pats get in if Baltimore loses, right? Or if Miami loses, right? Um. Yeah, it's got to be like nine and a half. I'm going to say Baltimore by nine and a half. All right. Well, I was considerable. I was way off on this. I said five and a half. You say nine and a half. It's 11 and a half. I think it's 12 now, but it opened at 11 and a half. It's a little high. This is my bet of the week. The Jags aren't that bad. They had a chance to win last week over the Colts. I love it. I love this. I love the Jags. They might win this game. Well, I, I, I know I'll be rooting for it. Yeah. I know I'm not betting on Flacco to blow anyone out just yet. Love the Jags here. I agree. I and you know if the Jags they won last week, right? Jags? No, they played the Colts tough and they lost by seven. The oh yeah, but they beat Green Bay in Week 15. They played yeah. the Colts tough. Then they win this game. At least they're not feeling like completely horrible about yeah. it, you know? Yeah, they stay within ten. Mm. Miami at the Jets. By the way, they really kind of screwed Madden over, didn't they? With, about which, that he didn't get to see uh, his man Favre? Yeah, his boyfriend Favre is playing. He uh, <laughs> they, they wanted an AFC game to, to be flexed into that Sunday night spot, and Madden's cruiser was parked in the Meadowlands anyway for the Panthers' giant. He wouldn't have had to move. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, hey, it's got to be Jets by three. Yeah, you got it. I said three and a half. I think that puts you on top for the week. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, ten. I've really been the Heath Ledger to your Jake Gyllenhaal this season. Good. Good. <laughs> you know how that ends up. You never saw that movie, so, oh, yeah, that's right. Ledger died in the end. <laughs> that's too bad. Uh, Dallas at Philly. This is the last one. Well, oh, before the night game, I guess we'll pick. And I, again, I'm sorry in advance eh, for whatever horrible for thing happens. What, what else could I break now that the remote's gone? And Do you ever think about just not watching it? Like just go to the movies and see the Benjamin Button movie or whatever? Yeah, I guess I could do that. Oh, man. I really should. What's the point? What is the point? These guys don't care about me. I got to say, Philly by three. All right. Well, I called this exactly. It's, it's uh, I said Philly by one, and that's what it is. Uh, well, that, what I should do is bet uh, $5,000 on the Eagles, right? I mean, that's you – know, they'll have – talk about buying a win. Is it Philly by one because potentially this game could mean nothing if Tampa wins? The NFL did, did the Cowboys a favor by moving that Tampa Bay – moving the Cowboys-Phillies to 4:15 Eastern and the Tampa right. If Tampa wins early, then Philly – has nothing to play for. Not that they're not going to come out uh, like gangbusters and beat us up anyway. But I should have factored that in. So that's pretty advantageous to you. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And by the uh, way, I want to uh, thank, well, I don't know what NFL Network uh, 
uh, anchor it was, but after the Cowboys Ravens game, uh, he said a few times that the Bucks have to lose both games for the Cowboys to get in, and I racked my brain till like three in the morning trying to figure out how this was the case, and uh, it was not the case. Of course, we went on a tiebreaker. Oh, I like that Terry Bradshaw on Sunday was talking about how nice it was that Mike Holmgren won his final game. <laughs> Nobody corrected him. He just kept kept expounding on it. Right. Yeah, Terry, actually, there's one more week left, but yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, and uh, finally, Sunday night. This is the big one. Uh, Denver at San Diego. So NBC had a choice of Dallas versus Philly or Denver San Diego, and went with Denver San Diego. I think something happened with where the conferences were lopsided. Like NBC had used up too many NFC games uh, or something. So Fox had... could. I think don't they aren't they able to protect one game each week too? Yeah, but there's also the the balance figures into of the conferences, which I thought like the Jets Dolphins would still even if the Jets couldn't. I mean, what was going to happen? That's still a big game, Jets Dolphins, right? Yeah, you could argue that that probably should have been the late game, but maybe they didn't want to screw the Pats over completely. But on yeah. the other hand, Dallas really does get an advantage with. Yep. Anyway, um, I I would like to watch this game with Ed Hockley, right? <laughs> It's been a while since the Hawks. How great would it be if they assigned him to it, though? I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> they just said, screw it, and they assigned him. But uh, it is great that he's not going to be working a game while it's on. Like, uh, he's got to be rooting for the Chargers, right? Um, the Hockley's haven't had me over in a while. I'm going to go over there. You would think that he would be rooting for whatever would take him off the hook, which right. would be the Chargers. I think Denver is terrible. I really think they're just bad. Like, you look at they've had one – Really nice win over the past few weeks, and it was at the Jets, which now after we've seen the Jets for a while, maybe that wasn't such a good win. Mm -hmm. They lost to Oakland. They got killed last week. I I just I don't know if they're good. Um, So I'm going to say San Diego by six and a half. Wow, that's a better call than than I made. I said San Diego by four and a half. It's nine. Oh! Nine is very high, right? That's a little high. I can't believe how high that line is for for a team that was four and eight three weeks ago. That should have been. Well, what? Or they were? They should could have been five and nine. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's ridiculous. That's high. That's ridiculous. But can you imagine how great it would be if they adopted my rule that you had to finish above five hundred to make the playoffs? Yeah. And. Potentially, Denver, could, you know, either neither of these teams could make the playoffs. Yeah, and the Patriots win the West. That'd be good. They got to figure out something. And, and it, this isn't sour grapes with the Pats, because I would be saying this, whoever it was. They just, if when you're in a division with four teams, and the other three teams are terrible, it's it's a huge advantage. It's, well, the it's worst too part big is of an all, advantage. All year we've been looking forward to Colts at uh, Broncos, right? The four-five right. game, and then, so we can pound the Colts, who will probably be a slight favorite. We figured. Yeah. But now if the Chargers win, it's a, we've talked about it, it's a little different, right? Yeah, I don't know. Hey, well, we shouldn't spoil next week's podcast, but, I, I yeah, I don't know if the Colts are favored in that game, if San Diego wins this one by, like, 30-3 to three or yeah. some, some, uh, That's some crazy score. So who won? I won again? Yeah, I don't want to count, but I think you won. You won. You're Heath Ledger, whatever you want to be, you won. <laughs> whatever... Whatever pop culture analogy yeah. involving a, a movie <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, yeah. Anyway, well, we're waiting for our friend Dicky. Oh, really? Yeah, he's gonna call because uh, he's doing all these Christmas shows back in Boston for his Road being down, the Mighty right? Mighty Boston. So we thought we'd promote it, and you could make fun of him a little bit. That'll be fun. That'll You'd be enjoy good. that, right? But while we kill time, if you had to pick a Super Bowl matchup, oh, he's ready. Here he is. Let's bring him in. I'd pick the Boston's and Third Eye Blind. Who would you pick as a Super Bowl matchup? <laughs> right now, uh, Giants-Steelers. All right, let's go to them in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. The lead singer of the Mighty Mighty Boston's the announcer for Jimmy Kimmel Live, our friend Dickie Barrett. Dickie, what's happening? How are you, William? How you doing, sports guy? I'm, uh, yeah, our friend Sal is also on the phone with us. Dickie, you can get excited. I'm here, too. Yeah. How are you, pal? <laughs> what's happening? Are, are, are Vinny and Fran there yet? <laughs> yeah, they're all here. The whole family's here. The only for the next they've arrived to town. This yeah. is the most wonderful time of the year, isn't it? <laughs> Dickie, tell us the times, dates, and uh, venue for your Mighty Mighty Boston Holiday Show. Let's get right to it. We're doing uh, four shows in Central Square in Cambridge at the Middle East Club, and uh, those are sold out. 
So there's no luck there. Unless yeah, you're in but, town, Willie, then I'll put you I'll put you on the guest list if you happen to be in town. <laughs> but what about Craigslist and eBay? You can you can potentially get in. No, we kind of we kind of set up a system where you can get around that. We we've got a scalper a, a virtually scalper free system going here. That's pissed <laughs> off a lot of people, but uh, oh. it's also made a lot of people happy. All right. So you have those so, four. And, Anything else? Then the night after that, we're going to, down to New Haven, Connecticut, and playing at Toad's Place there. And there are tickets available there. And then on New Year's Eve, it's uh, Lupo's, which is uh, it's actually a big theater now in downtown Providence. And we're doing our New Year's Eve show there. And then it's uh, back to California for a warm winter's nap. And what's uh, what? What do you have? Like 18 inches of snow back home right now? It was incredible, dude. I flew in uh, two mornings ago. I took a red eye and got in just before the blizzard. I think it was like the last flight, the last plane that moved on those runways, and then everything was tied up, and, and uh, a ton of snow was dumped, and it's freezing cold, and then, uh, you know, it took me about a half an hour to go, why Why am I here? Why do I live? Why am I not? You're back home, right, Bill? No, I'm actually still in L.A. Sal. Yeah. If you had to pick the top five least likely people to move from Boston to L.A. and then decide that they weren't coming back, Dickie and I would have been in the top five, right? You guys are the top five. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Right, because we, that. This is what happened is we had the misfortune of moving in to the to the uh, Jimmy Kimmel uh, compound. And yeah. once you're in there, there's no leaving. He makes it so pleasant, right? Yeah, well, you miss Cruz. You guys both missed Tom Cruise on the, at Jimmy's house on Sunday. It's Sal, tell the story very quickly. Came? Oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't tell you about this. Yeah. No. no. Well, I don't know if people want to get now, but screw it. We're talking. We're friends, right? Who cares? Yeah. No, tell it. Tom Cruise came by. He was on. Story? He was in our show last week. On our show last week, and ended up airing last night. And uh, he jokingly, we thought, said. Uh, yeah, I hear you cook for the fellas on Sunday. I cook, too. I'd like to stop by. And Jimmy laughed it off and said that would be the weirdest thing in the world. And then, sure enough, as the uh, later games were winding down, there's a knock at the door, and it's uh, Tom and uh, and Mrs. Cruz, not not uh, not Katie Holmes, but his mother. Tom Cruz brought his mother to football Sunday. You know? <laughs> How long did he stay for? He stay, He might still be there. Now, he was there He was there like uh, like two hours. He hung around. Two hours? Uh, he was there a long time, yeah. How did behave? I'm telling you, he uh, he um, he resolved mine and Jeff Ross's worst celebrity feud. He listened to both sides and uh, recommended that I apologize, and I did. And um, among <laughs> other things, Carolla showed him his t- touchdown dance where he you know craps out a football, and uh, oh, it was, it was delightful. What, did, what was his reaction to that? He smiled. He seemed to enjoy it. Our executive producer Jill Lederman uh, didn't like it too much, but uh, but no, uh, <laughs> Cruz Cruz enjoyed it. You it didn't make you did. So Jill was there too. Oh yeah, she was there. Yeah. Wait, so you ah. didn't make you didn't make Cruz reenact any all the right move scenes outside? No, no, I, we didn't do that. We weren't <laughs> we were in that chummy with him. Just <laughs> Although when he was he showed up in Jimmy's <laughs> living room in his underpants, <laughs> when he was forcing me to apologize, I said, "What kind of kangaroo court is this?" <laughs> I can't even believe that. It gets weirder and weirder. It, it really was, does. I mean, I thought la- I thought why I didn't leave. <laughs> I thought last week was weird with Don Draper and the Killers, but yeah, it's Kimmel stepped it up. We might have oh. to have like a webcam there or something. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, I told John Hamm, who was also there. I was like, "You are insignificant, buddy. You're, you're not even close to the best looking guy here." And, uh, he knew it. <laughs> <laughs> Top five weirdest events. We got to give that to Roddy Roddy Piper uh, putting Weinstein out. By the pool, right? He choked our friend Weinstein out with the sleeper hold, yeah. Yeah, that was pretty good. Man, that star studded year. Um, all right, uh, we have to go. Dickie. Listen, let me just say, because Dickie is too uh, too proud to uh, push it, but Medium Rare is his CD. It's got a bunch of great songs. My son knows it by heart. He, he won't even sing the songs on it from, uh, on it for the uh, concert, so don't expect that. But, so uh, Medium Rare on Amazon.com, right? Go out and buy it. Yeah, go out and buy it for our friend Dickie. I miss you a lot. William, I miss you as well. I miss all you guys. Love you very much. Merry Christmas. Thanks for letting me plug, Billy. Good good luck, uh good luck on the shows and say hi to everybody back home. Okay, Tom. Take care. All right. See Take care. Cousin Sal. All right, Bill. Listen, good luck this week. Just remember hey. it's only a game. I know. I'm gonna break. But send me something to break, will you? I'll send you yeah, I'll send you like a vase, a nice okay. fake vase. I could do a vase. Just shatter it. All right, we'll talk to you next week. Take care, man. Bye bye. All right, Christmas is coming up and as most of you know. One of my favorite Christmas movies, if not the famous Christmas movie. I, don't, I love Christmas Vacation. 
that's that's probably in my top three. Um, I don't know what the second of the top three would be because uh, I'm having a brain lock, but in the top three would be Rocky IV, which happened, the big fight happened on Christmas Day. I count it as a Christmas movie. It's a little controversial, but I had to have somebody from the Rocky series on for the holidays, and who better than the guy who played Apollo Creed? Uh, Apollo Creed, excuse me. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Carl Weathers, what's happening? Well, I'm sitting here in beautiful Southern California uh, on a sunny day with clouds in the sky. Uh, no rain falling at the time, but uh, our sky is clear because we got a little rain and hopefully not too many mudslides are happening. And uh, what else can I say? <laughs> well, it's great to have you on. Uh, I grew up with the Rocky franchise. I feel like you've been in my life basically since I could ever remember anything. Um, oh, so not only back. did you grow up with it, Bill, but so did I. I feel like <laughs> I've been in my life <laughs> ever well, since then. <laughs> well, you play, a lot of people don't know, you played with the Raiders. Yes, right? I did. I was with them for a moment. Uh, a great, great part of my my uh, past life and one of my past lives and uh, still involved with the team sort of peripherally and uh, get to visit with a lot of the guys every once in a while. Uh, not as... Uh, Happier days as uh, in the past, but still, uh, no. still good to be a part of that family. How um how many how many NFL teams did you play for? Just them, or were there other ones? Yeah, just the Raiders, and then I went on to the uh, CFL and played in Canada. What position? Were Lions. You? What position? Linebacker. Oh. so and then somewhere in the mid, I was looking at your IMDb, which is fantastic. Your oh. uh, your IMDb, your all the things you've been in. You've been in some classic TV shows, as like one episode or like Starsky and Hutch, and Good Times, yep. and Six Million Dollar Man. Yep. All, a lot of my favorites growing up, but then uh, you know Rocky happens in '76, so obviously you had to audition for Apollo. Yeah, Creed, I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those were those were uh, interesting days because as a young actor, of course, you come in a Los Angeles with uh, stars in your eyes and, and dreams of. Uh, you know, of, of making it big. I don't. I don't know that anybody dreams of making it small. So, right. You know, you come here, and at that time, the the wonderful thing about television was there was so many shows on that an athletic guy, a, a physical actor like myself, could be a part of. Right. Um, and as you said, you know, between Starsky and Hutch, and and uh, oh my God, uh, uh, Six Million Dollar Man, and uh, Kung Fu, and uh, uh, geez, uh, who were you on Good Times? Uh-huh. Do you remember? Again? Who were you on Good Times? Do you remember the on, role you played on, in that episode? On Good Times, I played a, a, a the neighbor's boyfriend. Ah. I can't even remember what what the story was, but uh, yeah, I came in as the neighbor's boyfriend. So you were you were Winona's boyfriend, probably? I think it was Winona. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think. I think, <laughs> but, but you know, it's so long ago. Yeah. Oh man, what a shame you guys couldn't have worked it out. So, well, <laughs> so with Rocky, I like real life, you know. <laughs> so with Rocky, so you get Apollo Creed, and Stallone is telling you, basically, he modeled the character after Muhammad Ali, right? So you have no, to figure I, out. You know what? I think I think that may have been a part of his intent, but you know how things morph uh, from intent to reality. I think what happened was uh, he was inspired by the Ali Wepner fight. Right. And so he created this uh, character for himself, which was very Wepner like a guy who, you know, had uh, uh, showed a lot of promise and who was big and who was tough. And But there was a side of him that was uh, sensitive, for lack of a better word, and and would never quite accomplish the kind of notor- or, or celebrity that a guy like uh, Ali would accomplish. And so he created this character who was Ali-like. To uh, pit against his Rocky character, and I was just lucky enough to walk in on a particular day when no one else seemed to be able to uh, capture the essence of that character, and you know the director and the producers and uh, uh, saw me and saw what I did, and uh, apparently, <laughs> apparently were somehow enthralled with 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 whatever I delivered on that day. And how much of Apollo was Carl Weathers, and how much of it was? Like pieces well, of other people that you. Well, I think I think a lot of Apollo was, was the dreaming Carl Weathers, you know. Right. Uh, was the Carl Weathers who could imagine himself uh, being all of that, uh, but of course a lot of that was borrowed from the likes of uh, of, of Muhammad, 
uh, who I'd, of course, uh, you know, like many kids, uh, idolized. Yeah. And uh, the likes of uh, all the other great boxers who were around at the time and some who had long since gone from Joe Lewis to Kid Gavilan to, uh, you know, the, the, you name it. Uh, right. Somebody who'd ever been a great boxer and I saw film on, I kind of borrowed from. How, Jack, uh, them, you know, it didn't matter. I, I was, I was very eager at that time simply to give a great portrayal of a, of a very flamboyant and, and, uh, and successful champion. Can you remember all the nicknames that Apollo Creed had? Oh, well, I can remember a few. I can remember uh, the King of Sting, yeah. the Master of Disaster, the, uh, the the Count of Monte Fisto. That was my favorite. I, I like that one the most. <laughs> only, you know, it's interesting, but only somebody like uh, Sylvester could come up with uh, with uh, coining a phrase like that one. Yeah. Um, and there were some others, I guess, uh, that probably escaped me at the moment, but... Hmm. But one I liked, the one I liked most, quite frankly, that I found funny because I, I was a kid. I grew up with Mad Magazine. Yeah. And I remember, and a lot of the audience won't even know what Mad Magazine was, I'm sure. But I remember there was one, every, after every Rocky, they did sort of this uh, story about the Rocky saga. I remember and, that because I got Mad Magazine. I totally remember this. Well, there you go. Because one of the, one of the uh, names they gave... Uh, Apollo was appalling greed. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I love that because I thought that was funny. Appalling yeah. greed. That, uh, well, how hard was it for you to pull off the boxing scenes? Did you have to, like, get special training or is it, like, natural oh, yeah. ability? Yeah, I, I was never a boxer uh, yeah. to begin with. And uh, I had uh, really great trainers. And, and, of course, again, you know, as every kid did, you pretended that you were whatever that thing is that you wanted to be, you know? Yeah. And if you were a kid and you saw Muhammad Ali and you were with your buddies hanging out, you'd show them how you could do Muhammad Ali. Yeah. And um, and so that was sort of, you know, sort of a part of, of, of I guess, our, our uh, national consciousness that a lot of kids, a lot of young guys walked around with. And, of well, course, I-, I was one of them. So when you get the opportunity, as a trained actor, uh, you know, I came out of theater, to be able to take that sort of childlike uh, uh, dream of, of, of wanting to be an Apollo Creed and mm-hmm. to be able to actually, you know, wrap that in your professional skills and, and in a way kind of co-op Muhammad, you know, and uh, transform him into a character for the screen. I mean, my God, man, how, how sweet is that? Well, here's how I know you did a good job, because in my living room in 1977, when the, or 76, whenever the soundtrack came out, I used to listen to all the songs and I would fight you in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> fight uh, Bill. 15 rounds and we would go at it. You don't remember this because you weren't oh, Bill, there. Bill, I remember, I, I, I remember I've, I've felt like somebody was hitting me, but they were yeah. rabbit punching me, you know, and I couldn't figure out who was hitting me. I kept looking behind me. I kept looking behind me, you know? Yeah, I would that reenact, well, I'd reenact like being sprawled on the ground, trying to pull myself up on the coffee table as Mickey told me to stay down. And so yeah, we went, we, you and I boxed a lot of rounds. So well, Rocky, I want to know one thing. How many, how many things did you break in the living room? <laughs> Probably a few. <laughs> but it, somehow I, be, I beat you, even though I was like six or seven. Somehow I, would, I was able to take you down. Well, here's so, what I want to know. Did yeah. your mom ever yell at you and say, what the heck are you doing in there? <laughs> Absolutely. Of but course. I, I was an only child. Say, mom, I'm beating on Apollo. <laughs> I was an only child. Well, who else was I going to play with? I had, I had to have yeah. some imaginary friends. Well, you so, know what? I'm so happy. It, it's either me or it's that giant rabbit, right? <laughs> So, you know, better, better, there's another reference, a movie reference that somebody else be uh, out there saying, what are you talking about, a giant rabbit? <laughs> well, I'll top that one, because the other guy I was terrified of was when Andre the Giant played Bigfoot in Six Million Dollar oh, Man. So I had, a, I had a lot of fake fights with Bigfoot as well. Oh, my goodness, man, you really, really are a lost cause. I know, it's terrible. So wait a second, so... So Rocky comes out. So you see a screening of Rocky, and at this point, you know, you know, it's, it's it wasn't an independent movie, but it was definitely kind of made on on the down low a little bit. And yes. at what point did you realize, all right, my life is going to change because this movie? Well, the point you realize that things change is when the night before the movie's out, you're walking down the streets of Manhattan, and nobody pays you any attention. And the morning after the movie comes out. Street vendors are yelling, yo, Apollo. Wow. I know your life has changed. I don't think you're prepared for that, you know. 
it's not like you have a, a coterie of people around you and a mentor who's preparing you and you go to school and say, okay, tomorrow, uh, you know, the D-Day is uh, whenever it is, and on that day you're going to have some sort of fame and celebrity because people are going to recognize you. Yeah. It might be the way you dream about it, but it doesn't normally happen that way. So you're not quite prepared for that kind of recognition, you know? Well, and back then, you know, you're talking mid-70s. There's no Internet. There's no cable TV. There's no iPods. There's there no wasn't? direct TV. Well, I mean, there, there was basically – we had three network channels. And going to the movies at the time was, I think, a bigger communal experience than it is now. So if a movie like Rocky becomes a big movie, everybody feels like they have to see it. I don't know if that's the case now. Now you can wait till it comes out on DVD or. Yeah, you know but I, mean? I think you know there are still those movies. There are still those movies. There are those those iconic sort of franchises, as, as we call yeah. them, that uh, people will stand in line for and 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 be there and want to go see. They want to be the first to see it. And true. Experience is, of course, a communal experience. I, I think, though, your point regarding Rocky is very true. Uh, number one, it came out of nowhere, so no one had sort of a premonition of, oh, this is going to be, well, not no one, because a few of us thought we had something. But, you know, you, you, the audience isn't aware of what's coming. Right. So there's no publicity because there's no budget. <laughs> Whereas like, and, with something like Jaws, there was the book, and people knew that they were oh, making yeah. it into a movie and something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you had a few things going for a movie like Jaws, and it was yeah. you know, universal and I mean, you know, it, it wasn't the Steven Spielberg we know today, but it's yeah. Steven Spielberg who had done wonderful work prior to that. Right. Uh, I know I remember Duel was one of the scariest movies I ever saw that he did, and I was such a fan of of the way he constructed movies as a director, you know? Right. And um, and and then it had Richard Dreyfuss in it, and it had Scheider, and, and you know, and, uh, and one of my all-time favorites, uh, Robert Shaw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, that movie, it seemed to me, was like, you know, that movie could get press. People would know about that. But when it came to Rocky, you know, the most most noteworthy person in the cast was Burgess Meredith, who yeah, had been true. around forever, of course. And maybe Talia Shire, because she was in The Godfathers. Yeah, she was in The Godfather, but, but, you know, they couldn't sell the movie on Talia because it wasn't really about Talia. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It was, yeah. but it wasn't. It really was about Rocky. So you didn't have, you, didn't, you know, you didn't have the star of so and so to be able to sort of promote the movie. You had uh, a few of us who were relative unknowns. So the yeah. movie, the movie's a huge success. You're living in Los Angeles, I assume, at the yeah. time. Actually, and, at uh, the time, no, I was at the time I was living in Oakland. I, I hadn't that long ago been with the Raiders and then went to Canada, and um, huh. I was still living in Oakland. Well, you, you, so you become a, a very famous celebrity in a very famous movie during probably the best era to become a famous celebrity, the, the disco era 70s. That must have been fun. One of, one of the best eras. <laughs> oh, what was a better era than the late 70s? Well, I, you know, I don't know so much that it was a better era, but I, I think that the era of studios having actors under contract, oh. you know, the years of, of, of Humphrey Bogart and... And uh, and and the early years of Marlon Brando, and I mean, there were so many actors out there who just did phenomenal work. Yeah. And 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 made movies that today we still revere, you know. Yeah. So I, I think there was something about that era that, as I look back on it, really would have been fascinating to be a part of. However, uh, to your point, the '70s created some magnificent movies, and, and there were some. Directors that came out of the '70s that still today are considered some of the best directors that have ever you know, gotten behind a camera. So, see, I was going another direction because I'm a degenerate. I was thinking more about like the Babes, the partying. Oh man, come on! You <laughs> the know late what? '70s. Come on, that was the golden it's, era. I wish, I wish, I wish there was Babes and partying. Uh, come on, the, you're Apollo Creed. How did? How would you? How yeah. are you not having Babes every night? Well, I was so naive. I was so naive at the time. I had no idea that I was a celebrity. Uh, I mean, I, you know, to me, it was all about Rocky. Yeah. And what you were really out there doing now was trying to build a career and get another job, you know. And there weren't that many roles that I really 
that I really wanted that were coming my way. It was a very different time, you know? And did you feel a little stereotyped, too, because of Apollo Creed? Oh, like you were absolutely. pigeonholed as that character? Yeah. You know, you know one of the greatest, one of the greatest uh, detriments to, in some ways, to, to uh, uh, growth is almost instant success. Yeah. Because, you know, when you do something that's so definable, in a way... People think, oh, well, you were a boxer. That's who you are. Yeah. You know, there's no idea that, oh, this is an actor. And I didn't have the luxury of, uh, of a promotional campaign you know, by a studio who, who touted me as an actor. And I didn't have publicity people and all that sort of stuff because I made no money off that first movie. But the second one, when they came to you for Rocky II, you're ready to go. Well, I was ready to go. However, the, the story of Hollywood is uh, you can be. You can be fooled by a lot of things, and at the time, um, I was not—I was not represented by people who, I think, I, I, not the best way to say it, and the kindest way to say it, and the way to keep myself out of trouble is I don't think they had my interest at heart. Because you had a lot of leverage, given that the rematch. I had more Apollo, leverage than I realized yeah. I had. <laughs> yeah, put it that way. Hmm. Far more than I realized I had. But then Rocky Three, you, you were essential to that one too. So by that yeah, time, it Rocky was good, Three right? was a whole different ball game. Rocky yeah. Three, I was a little more savvy, and I had a decent agent at the time, and it made life a little more beneficial in a lot of ways. That's good. But, uh, you know, you look back on it, and you realize, you know, you you realize how naive you were and how little you knew about the business part of this thing that we're in. Hmm. So how did you know? You've obviously known Stallone now for. 33 years you do this first movie with him he's a nobody second movie he's writing it directing it he's one of the most famous people in the country do you feel like he stayed close to what he was in that first or were there some inevitable changes like what did you see from him oh man i i don't know that any of us have stayed close to what we were in the first movie uh, yeah because you know you either you either go forward or you go backward you can't stay the same yeah you know i think uh it's inevitable that if you try to stay the same, you are going to go backwards. So, you know, the the growth there and, and the maturation and hopefully a certain degree of sophistication and education. I mean, you learn things as you go along, and you recognize that this business is a, a very, very, very lucrative business in some cases, but it also requires a tremendous amount of money to get something going. So um, I, I think we all change. We better change. So you liked his changes for the better? Oh yeah, I think I think all of our lives have changed for the better. Now that doesn't necessarily mean, though, along with change, isn't going to come some stuff that's not going to be particularly pleasant. I mean, that's you know that's you know, that's a that's par for the course. You're going to have the good stuff and you're going to have the bad stuff. So did you see that you did four movies with Stallone? At what were in, in two, three, or four? Was there one where you're like, oh my God, it's gone to his head? No, no, not with me. I never saw that with me. Maybe somebody else saw that, but. No, I was talking I about Stallone. My experience, my experience in all four movies was, first of all, we knew the movie was called Rocky. It wasn't called Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going in knowing that, right? Yeah. And, and in terms of a working relationship, uh, you know, I was given actually a lot of flexibility in terms of, of what I was doing and how I was doing it, but I'm not dumb. I mean, I recognize what the parameters were with this character and what was essentially, you know, sort of instigated in 1976 when we shot the first one. So this is who you are and this is what you do and this is why you're there and this is what you're after. And regardless of whether it's Rocky or it's uh, Star Wars, yeah. you know, the same parameters in writing and, and acting and, and, and delivering a movie pretty much exist. So you get the Rocky Three script. Mm -hmm. Oh, first of all, you get Rocky Two, you lose in Rocky Two. You get the Rocky Three script... Now you're going to train. You're going to train yeah. Stallone. So you're like, oh, cool. This will be fun. You get the Rocky IV script, you're going to die in the ring. This Russian oh, steroids guy is going to kill you in the ring. Not good. Yeah, you were bummed. Not good. Bummed. Absolutely. Because you could have been in Rocky V and Rocky VI, but you know, instead you're killed off. By the way, even if, if Apollo Creed died in Rocky IV, he could have still been in Rocky V and Rocky, Rocky VI. Yeah, it's like a ghost, yeah. Did you see me in Happy Gilmore come back, and I was in heaven, and I had my hand back? To see what could happen in the movies? Come uh, on! So it's how sad... Fantasy. Fantasy. How sad, was, uh, how sad was it to kill off Apollo? Well, it was sad for me for a lot of reasons. Of course, one was... Uh, 
there wasn't going to be another paycheck from from Rocky. <laughs> okay, you know, let's get real. Yeah. Um, there was no no longer was Apollo going to be a part of that franchise, and uh, so you know. But who knew there was going to be a Rocky Five? I didn't know. Nobody knew really. You know. Yeah. Uh, we didn't know after Rocky One there was going to be a Rocky Two. Hey, who uh, knew who knew Rocky Four was going to end the Cold War? Who knew so that? You hear like his speech. You know, that turned everything around. Nope. So, what, what was your favorite scene that you did? If you had to pick one scene that you loved the most. I'll tell you one that I enjoy watching the most. <laughs> this is bizarre. It is James Brown. Being on stage with James Brown in Las Vegas. Yes. To me, was like one of the moments in my life I will always cherish. Because I grew up idolizing James Brown. I mean, how many, how many kids didn't? Right. You know, and certainly kids from my neighborhood. I mean, I, you're talking about in music in popular music an absolute icon around the world james brown has influenced more musicians and more people on stage i mean you look at michael jackson he's a version of james brown you know right but uh you know to be on stage with him and to be in the context of rocky and to have that whole sort of show going on in las vegas i mean it was like it was like a dream a fantasy moment in movies, you know, that you could put on and say, what are some of the, what's one of, if you did movies and you watched movies and you said, what is the most, one of the most spectacular moments ever in a film? That's like going back to the, to, to the time of the Romans in the Colosseum, you know, right. a huge act, center stage. Yeah. So I just, I just remember that and love that. Well, hey, as Warner Wolf said, what started out as a joke turned into a disaster because it ended yeah. with Rocky cradling your uh, your lifeless body as there's 6,000 people in the ring, all of them interviewing Drago, and, the, and you're not getting any hospital attention, which I would have been upset about if I were you. Well, I got to get a doctor in there. I got to tell you something. And nobody I mean, was, I remember uh, Sly calling out, where's the doctor? Get a doctor in here. And, uh, you know, the doctor was off having a drink or he, or he was at the crap table. I can't <laughs> what's going on there. No uh, ambulance. Was laying in the ring. I mean, come on. You got You and Sly both got hurt. Uh, filming the fight scenes. I think in, was it the first one? Both of you suffered injuries that were like, well, fairly you know serious, right? I never, I never had anything serious, but, uh, you know, it was very, very, very tough. Go for as many hours as we go every day in those fights. Yeah. You know, you, you literally would be dead tired and you've got to do another take or your body would be cramping up because you're just sweating constantly. I mean, for eight, ten hours a day. And, you know, even though we had masseur there and, and, you know, we were being hydrated constantly. It's just that, that number of hours to do that kind of physical stuff just caused pulls and strains. And, you know, mm. to this day, I've got some nerve damage in an arm because really? a lot of punches that don't connect with anything. Yeah. And every, every once in a while, somebody does connect and it doesn't feel too good. So, you know, it wasn't severe uh, damage, but uh, it took its toll. Did any either of you accidentally knock each other down? No, I don't think anybody, but I know there were a number of times we really got tangled up and wound up trading some punches, kind of like, uh, you know, back off a little bit. Really? Oh, so yeah. it got a little heated in there a couple of times. Well, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of like macho stuff, you know? Yeah. Get in there and uh, it just happens, man. Oh, see, I thought he like tore his pectoral muscle or something in one of the fights. Yeah, he did, but I think a lot of that came in training to bulk up for some of the stuff, you know? Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. So then, um, wait, I had one more, I had one more fight question. About oh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, the, the training scene. I, I've joked about it in comms. You guys have the beach race at the end. We have the uh, what? You, you on the beach in Rocky Three? Yeah. You know, yeah. you're training them. That's the, is there any way in real life Stallone beats you in a sprint? We should put that race together and find out. I, did you have to? You were. It looked like in the climactic scene when he passes you. I felt like you were on cruise control. I got to be honest. Uh, is that what you felt like? Huh? That's what I felt like. I just uh, feel you like. Can you comment on that? I just feel like you, you. If you're really going all out, you probably beat Stone. But but in your defense, this is Apollo. Apollo wants Rocky to beat him, so he's subconsciously uh, holding up, right? A little something to get the you know to get the guy to, to feel he can get get it done. You know what I mean? Right. Any great trainer, any great coach, is going to find a way to motivate. You know, and that's what Apollo was about motivating. Now, did Apollo throw that race? I'm not going to go that far. I'm never going to go that far. But let's put some money on the line and see who can take care of whom. At what point when you guys were hugging each other and jumping up and down in the water, did it start to feel a little weird? 
Well, at the time that uh, his hand was sort of going down my back, I thought, wait a minute here. You know, <laughs> you know this embrace is lasting a little too long. Yeah. Uh, it never felt weird, man. Come on, you know. <laughs> ever, have you ever looked at these guys in the huddle slapping each other on the back? <laughs> Come on. Well, I'd like to thank you for that moment because I've beaten that joke into the ground more than ever, really, about the, oh, uh, for, the uh, awkward uh, beach hug. It's been great. I thought you it's were been... going to say that. That you meant to thank me for that moment because that's one of your favorite moments ever. To just oh, no, no, no. The good old days. No, you weren't going to go there. No, no, no. It's brought me a lot of comedic mileage. I, I oh, yeah. still... All right. All right. Well, you know what? I'm happy that we could give you uh, a laugh or two. <laughs> hey, one more thing about your uh, your IMDb that I would forgot. Well, actually, two things. I yeah. loved Action Jackson. And, you know, you, you guys had Sharon Stone. Yes. Really, you know, about four or five years before Basic Instinct, but when she was like a little hidden secret, I love Sharon no, Stone. No, she was beautiful, she, wasn't she? She was smoking hot in that movie. Vanity was in it. She was smoking hot. I loved yeah. Action Jackson. Why? How come no Action Jackson too? You know what? Been beating that one around for years. Couldn't get the producers to get off of it. Uh, let us make the movie. I don't know, man. I've been asked that question from people from. I've been asked that question from Australia to Germany to the U.K. to the U.S. People liked that movie. Yeah, it was and great. So, but so. I almost, would you say there was like a little bit of racism there? Like people, they didn't want black action heroes in the 80s? Because that's well, the only logical thing I, I can think of. Know, I, first of all, I don't know if that's true because uh, there were a few around. You know? Who? One of them being uh, Jim Brown. Jim Brown was one of the biggest stars ever. Yeah, but Action Jackson was like a big budget action well, I, film. No, it that wasn't. Was... Action Jackson wasn't a big budget. That's that was part of the problem. Uh... But here's, the, here's the deal. This is what I think happened. What I think happened was when we made the picture, it was uh, one studio was around. That yeah. studio went away, sold their entire library to Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers had some action stars that I think they banked a lot on. Uh, one of them in particular was doing the same sort of stuff, and I don't think they wanted to have a conflict. And as a result, uh, the producer wanted a lot of money to, you know, to sort of take his name off of it, and eventually it just wasn't going to happen. Because if you had made the sequel, like, say, 90, yeah. and then Basic Instinct coming out the yeah. next year and you had Sharon Stone in it again, it would have been a much bigger movie. Because like, oh my God, Sharon right. Stone, blah, 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 blah. But as it turned out, right. it was like you missed it a, like, like a year. Man, why aren't you producing? Come on. I should be. They, listen, you're not telling me anything I don't know. The other thing that uh, – well, I loved Action Jackson, and it, it really bothers me that there's never a sequel. The other thing that I thought was interesting is that you hosted SNL in yep. 1988. Yes. How was that? Oh, that was fun. That was an awful lot of fun and scary as hell. Yeah? Those shows are real. You know, you don't have any – Got rehearsal time, and then all of a sudden it's time for the show to go on, and bang, you you do the dress, and then you do the other, and they're both uh, taped, and uh, right. you know it's flying, it's fast and furious, but it was a lot of fun, an awful lot of fun, bunch, a great bunch of, of, of really uh, talented people on that show, always have been. So are you, you're still acting, I assume, right? Oh yeah, yeah, but I'm doing a lot of directing now, and really, more and more, yeah, yeah. I'm actually sitting here. My editor just walked in to work on this project I'm about to finish up. Interesting. Have you directed anything that's already out? Uh, yeah, I've done some television. I've been doing television since 93 and uh, had a fairly decent run and then um, went away and started raising cattle. <laughs> and um, when I came back, uh, you know, as, as so much of Hollywood is, uh, yeah. you leave for five minutes, you're dead. So that's it. I died yeah. and now I've come back to life and now it's uh, getting myself re- I guess reintroduced to the world. Oh, excellent! Well, great luck with that. Um, thanks Thank so much for coming on. Thanks for uh, all your great work over the years, and uh, really enjoyed everything you've done. Hey, Bill, I sure appreciate it, and uh, good talking to you, man. I look forward to talking to you again sometime. All right, take care. Thank great you. you mm -hmm. Bye bye. All right, and now for our Jewish readers, a holiday song from my daughter. Welcome, Hanukkah, Feast of Light. Let's burn a candle every night. Watch the dreidel spinning around. Eat the lockers tasting round. Welcome Hanukkah, feast of light. Let's burn a candle every night. Nice work. 
Say happy holidays. Happy holidays, Joe. <laughs> All right, good job, Zoe. Target the sun off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.